right? Uh, now, last time, as we left, uh, uh, I, I read you a few a few prophecies out of the maybe 300 or so that, that were given to the house of Israel and all its other different names in the Bible, and said, who in history, in today's history, from starting from 1800, who f fulfills these, these prophecies? When you look at the world, who, who is this? But I want to show you the verses this time. You, know, you might just want to take these things down uh, for later on, or go back and review over the tape or the uh, uh, the video. Uh, what do you got here now? You got Isaiah. The first one I want to look at is the the prophecies that that the Israelites would wind up on the coasts. Mentioned that already. Coast, the Isles, and North. Okay, that pins down the 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 the, the area, right? Not just North. If you just go North from Palestine, you run into the Caucasus Mountains and you run into the, the Black Sea and up in there. You know that's North. Another prophecy says Northwest, gathering from Northwest, but North, it's not on the coasts though. No. Coasts and islands. The oh, the coast of the Black Sea. Mm. Coasts, coasts, and isles in the north. The British Isles, right? Okay, not Cyprus. Okay, forty-one. Isaiah forty-one, one. Uh, Isaiah has an awful lot to say to the Isles, or the Isles of Far Off. And so does Jeremiah, which we'll see, the Isles. He says in 41, he says to the Israelites, okay, uh, who haven't been conquered yet, okay, Isaiah wrote, these prophecies to the house of Israel before they were conquered by the Assyrians. Okay? And he says that keep silent. He's talking to Israel here. Keep silent before me, O isles, islands, and let the people renew their strength. Let them come near and let them speak and let us come near together in judgment. Keep silent before me, O Isles. Let the people renew their strength. The Assyrians take the house of Israel, take it away completely. Over a course of 500 years, they wind up way over in west and northern, western, north, northwestern Europe and the British Isles. And Isaiah says, relax over there. Just be quiet for a while and let my people renew their strength and get ready for what? Renew their strength for what? To get God, through Jesus and Christianity, out to the whole world. The Christian nations of the world phew, disseminate the Bible to the rest of the world. That's what their job is. It's always been the Israelites' job is to get God to the rest of the world. Keep silent before me, O Isles, Britain. Let me go back and remind you of something that I, I know I mentioned already. One of the early segments, maybe it's the overview. You take up any of these prophets, the major or minor prophets, big books and small books is all that is, uh, plus plenty of other books that aren't called prophets, and look at all of the names that are given, all of the prophecies that are given to, to the house of Israel by all of its different names, right? Jacob, Joseph, Israel, house of Jacob, house of Joseph, house of Israel, house of Isaac, sometimes, uh, Israel, Ephraim, Samaria, probably one or two other names in there. 
Well, any prophecy that goes to any of those names, you just put a little line through it, okay? Put a little line through it with your pencil, and on top of it, you say B slash US. Britain and the US. Keep silent before me, O Isles. Britain and the US, be silent, wait for whatever. All of a sudden, the whole Old Testament, all the prophecy is going to open up to you. You'll understand exactly what's going on. Because you just take your top of your head prof, uh, history knowledge that you got out of high school and say, well, who in history did what this prophet says they're going to do? And you'll find it won't be the Chinese or the black people or the brown, brown races or anything. It'll be the, the British Isles and the U U.S. <laughs> Islands and Coasts, Isaiah 51, verse 5, 51 verse 5 says, The isles shall await upon me, and on mine arm they shall trust. Hearken unto me, my people, and give me ear, O my nation, for a law shall a law shall proceed from me this is god talking right a law shall proceed from me and i will take my judgment for the rest of the people uh, for the rest for the light of the people my righteousness is near my salvation has gone forth this law is coming right that's christ it's christ uh, my salvation has gone forth and my mine arms shall judge the people the isles shall wait upon me, and upon mine arm shall they trust. I'm going to send Jesus, and in the meantime, the isles are going to wait for me. Be silent, O isles. <laughs> Renew your strength. And as I said before, Jeremiah also has some things to say about the isles. Right? Jeremiah 31 and 7 through 10. Uh, 7 through 10. 31. Thus saith the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations. Publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save thy people, the remnant of Israel. House of Israel. Save the remnant of the house of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country. God will bring the house of Israel from the north country, hmm? in the coasts and the isles. I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth, not the coasts of the Black Sea, the coasts of the earth, right? North America, South America, uh -huh. okay, coasts of the earth, and with them the blind, the lame, the woman, the child, Travail with child together, a great company shall return hither. They shall come weeping. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off. And say, He that scattered Israel, did you see Hosea and the whore? Hosea's kids, the three kids, told what was going to happen to the house of Israel before it happened, prophecy, they'd be scattered, would lose their identity, and not have God's full mercy. What is Jeremiah saying here? A hundred years later, okay, what does he say here? He, ha he that scattered Israel will gather them. Coasts the Isles, and the North. Now what about the empire? Is there going to be an empire, a world empire, a company of nations, a multitude of nations, whatever? Where do you find that in Genesis 16? I can find that real quick. Oh, I bent that page. 16. Wait, 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 wait. Genesis, that's the page number. It's 17.4. 17.4. Oh, but I got to read 
more than 17.4. See, uh, Abram is 90 years old and nine. The Lord appeared to Abram, 90 and nine, and said unto him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be thou perfect. I will make my covenant between thee and me and will multiply thee exceedingly. <clears throat> now, he's already told him some of this stuff, but he's telling him again, exceedingly. As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be the father of many nations. Multitude of nations. Many nations. Neither shall thy name be any more called Abram, but thy name shall now be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Many nations. Not one after the other. Not for the last 2,500 years there'll be 10 different nations successively down through history. This is, this is when he has his descendants like the multitude, multitude the, the stars in the sand. When that is in existence, there will be nations there, multiple nations. The tribes will be full nations all around Northwest Europe. You know, France, Netherlands, Denmark, nations, a multitude of nations. And, and I will make thee exceedingly fruitful and will make nations of thee and kings shall come out of thee. Kings all from the line of Judah and nations of Israelites ruled by Judah. Okay. Uh, 43, okay. Same thing. Same thing here. This is uh, uh, Genesis 35, 10. Okay. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Oh, well, he's changing names again. See, changing names. But it's Jacob now. It's not Abraham. Oh, Jacob. Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And, and he called his name Israel. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation, a nation, and a company of nations. You see that separation there? A nation, a great nation, one of the greatest nations of history, and a company of nations. Company of nations shall be with thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And I'll give you the land that I gave your fathers. That's the same thing he just told Abram. Didn't he? Down in, in earlier chapters, now he repeats himself. He told Isaac pretty much the same thing. Now it's now it's to Jacob. Okay, when God repeats himself, pay attention, and he means what he says. There's no in, misinterpretation there. Okay. Um. In forty nine. Remember when Jacob passes out the birthright? Before he does that, Joseph brings his two sons, Manasseh the older and Ephraim the younger, for a blessing. Not a prophecy, just a blessing, you know? And he pushes the kids toward Jacob. We can't see because he's old and he's ready to die. And instead of putting his right hand, the hand of blessing and power, on Manasseh, firstborn, primogenitor, firstborn, supposed to get everything. Instead of putting it on his right hand, his right hand on Manasseh, he crosses his hands and puts his right hand on Ephraim. And Joseph says, hey, you got it wrong here. This guy here, is, he's the firstborn. Just settle down. I know. He will, be, he will be a great nation, a people, a great people. But Ephraim will be a company of nations. He'll be bigger than Manasseh. There it is again. One nation, a great nation, and a company of nations. Two things. Right? And then on 
62. Oh, well, I guess I got ahead of myself, but this is chapter 49 again. No, that isn't 49. 49, 49, 19. Bad writing on my part here. 48, 19. Okay? That's what I just, just what I told you. 48, 19. <laughs> Truly his younger brother, Ephraim, shall be greater than he, Manasseh. His seed shall become a multitude of nations. He says, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people. He also shall be great. A great nation. But his younger brother, Ephraim, is going to be a, a world empire. And just to clarify, in the First World War and the Second World War, the Western allies, France and all that, okay, um, the Western Allies were a company of nations, weren't they? But they weren't a world empire. France was never part of the British Empire. Neither was Denmark. Okay? Ephraim became a world empire, the ruler of a world empire, a company of nations, that kind of a company, not just an association kind of a company. They ruled. Okay? Just for clarification purposes. And, and it also, one of the, um, the promises that we had was <clears throat> that uh, they'd go everywhere. Right? They'd go everywhere. They, they would, they would uh, spread abroad, so to speak. Here, page 33. 33, 33, it's 28.14. 28.14. Uh, well, 13 ends this way. He says, The land whereon thou liest, to thee, this is Jacob when he has that dream, and then he anoints the rock, uh, Bethel, and so forth, and he sees, and, okay. Uh, Whereupon thou rest, I will give it to thee, and, and, the, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, which is what he told Abram. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, and the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And that goes two ways. That goes two ways. Most of traditional Christianity wants to say, that's Christ. Christ blesses that whole... But there's another way that's important to notice also. That's true. That's true. But how did Christ, how did Christ get to all the nations of the world to be blessed? By the British and the American missionaries, right? Starting with Joseph of Arimathea in 37 AD, who built seminaries up there in Glastonbury, and got the word of Christ out to everybody, okay? That was Israelites, that was their job from the very beginning, to show God to the rest of the world, to bless all of Ab Ab Abraham's seed and all of Jacob's seed, all of the Israelites, not just Christ, would be involved in blessing the whole world with God's information. His name, his plan, his reality. Spread abroad. And they did, didn't they? Those Israelites are everywhere. There's plenty of evidence that Israelites are down in South America, are in Central America. Israelites, get this part, in 1,000 no, 
1400, 1000 BC, 1000 BC in Las Lunas, New Mexico. There's a big religious complex, you know, mounds and buildings and stuff, you know, big temple area. Okay? In this temple area, there's a, a rock face about four by four. See if I can find it here uh, quickly. It showed up one other time when I was looking through here. Four by four rock face that's inscribed. It's got a, a, a big, um, a heavy inscription on it. Lots and lots of lines of, of, uh, of, of information on there. And as I said, it's, it, it, it's, it's given the date of 1000 BC. Well, who was, who was ever in the area of New Mexico in 1000 BC? Uh, oh, well, I've, I've, I've got to look this, I've got to look this up now, huh? Because, um, because I told you about it, like, I got to show it to you. Uh, wait a minute, 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 Las Lunas, 155, 155, I knew it was close in here. 155. Here's, uh, here's what's on the rock, all of this writing there, okay? That's what's on the rock. And it's an ancient, ancient Hebrew. 1000 BC in New Mexico, ancient Hebrew. Here's the rock. Oh, and there's, there's E. Raymond Capt, right? There's the rock right there. What does that rock say? Huh? What is that, what is that writing in ancient Hebrew? Las Lunas Decalogue. Decalogue? That's the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are written on this rock in 1000 BC. How could that happen? How could that possibly happen? Haven't I told you several times that the tribe of Dan with their cousins all became the Phoenicians and they went everywhere? The tribe of Dan, the Phoenicians, were over in, 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 in America, and they not only just got there, but they had time to inscribe the Ten Commandments. Remember, that's 400 years after Moses got them from God on, the Bible, on, on Mount Sinai. 400 years, okay? Dan made all of those migrations that we're gonna find out about later on, all, all over Northwest Europe. And remember I talked about about the River Don and all the, the Danube and the Sardinia and all those Dan names, right? They were over there in, in New Mexico, 1000 BC, and had this big temple complex all built and everything. They went everywhere, those Israelites, okay? Uh, 35, no, wait, wait, which is a stone? And thy seed shall spread abroad. Spread abroad. My margin says break forth. Ooh, spread forth. And there's, there's another one coming up here. 62. It's Genesis 49, 19. 49, 19. A troop shall overcome overcome at last get no that's that was that 4819 and the, the different one spread abroad spread abroad is 33 oh yeah I'm on the wrong line here okay uh, 259 is Deuteronomy Deuteronomy and it's 33. 17. 
there's a lot of 17s in here, you know, and 17 is a number for victory. Also, it's connected heavily with resurrection. And it's mentioned twice in connection with Noah getting on and off the ark. 17th is a important day for God. Deuteronomy 33, 17. His glory, this is all Joseph, okay? Starts at verse 13 through 17, takes, takes half of a column. A lot to say for Joseph, same as when Jacob passed out the birthright, but this is Moses before they go into the promised land and he's giving all the tribes their blessings, okay? Uh, but way down at the bottom of, of verse 17, he says, uh, his glory is like the first thing of his, the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of a unicorn, and with them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. And they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, ten thousands of Ephraim, world empire, bigger than the United States, and they are the thousands of Manasseh, his brother great company. And there you got three different times. Three different times. Jacob says it. He says it. Um, Jeremiah says it. And, and Moses says it. You got two different things happening here. One great people and one great empire. Okay, they're going to spread abroad. Spread abroad. Uh, that's also in Isaiah 27. 27. Oh well, let's let's take a look at Isaiah 27:6. 20, 27, 6 says, "He shall cause them uh, that come out of Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit." Metaphorically speaking, they're going to go everywhere. They're going to be everywhere. Okay, push the other people to the ends of the earth. Didn't we push the Indians to the end of the earth? All right, okay. Undefeatable. You've heard me talk about that a bunch. Undefeatable. They're going to be undefeatable, which is Isaiah 54, 17. <laughs> and we got some good background here on, on, on Isaiah 54. But let me read this to you here. 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall raise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of God. Okay. He's talking to Israel here. Um, I call Isaiah not the book of Isaiah, but the book of Israel. Because it's mostly about the house of Israel and their, what they do, what they're going to do, what they have been doing. Uh, and when Christ comes, how they relate to him and what will happen to them after that. It's all about the house of Israel. And in chapter 53, which is right in front of 54, right? And there's no chapter and verse here. It just keeps right on going. Isaiah didn't stop and say, well, I'll have dinner and then I'll write a new chapter. You know, there's period, next sentence, boom. Okay. And 53 is the suffering Messiah. The, uh, the, the messianic chapter, you know, um, handles Messiah. Um, and it follows the starting... Isaiah 53 is, is God brings Christ for the lost tribes. Okay? For the lost tribes, starting with 49 through 54. That's where Christ comes in, 49 through 54. But way back in 41, he's talking about, we read some of that, about Israel and all that and what they're going to do and their history and what's going to happen to them later on. And then, in right end time, in order on the line, comes Christ, and he gets crucified and resurrected. A 
wow, it's resurrected. And then because of that, Isaiah says, sing, O ye barren. If you start with 54 and don't connect it somehow with 53, you're going to wonder who that barren is. Sing, O ye barren, O that, were did, that, that did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that did not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife. Well, what kind of sense does that make? You know? You've got to do some digging to find out what's going on there. Somebody didn't have any kids. They thought. But God says, no, oh, you had more kids. You had more kids than this other group over here. Who is the desolate wife? Who is the married wife? Well, God made a covenant with all 12 tribes. And he said, you're my people, you're my inheritance, you are my wife. We're married. And every time they got off the track, he used idol worship uh, when they did idol worship, he used sex, adultery, unfaithfulness, and so forth to characterize what they were doing. They were whoring around down in Egypt. Whatever. Okay? Because they were an unfaithful wife. They would understand that. Okay? Well, God said only one wife, didn't he? <laughs> you know? Um, but they decided that they were going to split. And now God's got two wives. They made, they made God a bigamist, okay? But he still looks at them as though they were a wife. And, okay, if you do right, remember he told Jeroboam, he said, if you do it right, you'll be like David. Boy, and Jeroboam went right to idol worship immediately. And God gave him 200 years to get better. And they didn't. So he said, okay, I'll divorce you. Jeremiah says that. He gave him a bill of divorcement. Out of here. He didn't, he didn't divorce the tribe of Judah and the kingdom of Judah down below. They were still married. The Israelites lost their identity, didn't they? They didn't know who they were, right? For a long, long time. They had inklings, but, you know, none of these history guys knew who they were. You know, they didn't know who they were. They didn't have God's mercy. They were scattered all around and everything. And they weren't God's people anymore. They just weren't. Not so the Jews. Even the Jews that went, smaller groups that went with the Israelites and settled in different places, they were always connected with God, the God of the Bible. Always when they didn't have a nation, when they didn't have a city, when they did have a city, never, never in history have they been separated from God. They've always been married to God. But not the Celts or the Scythians. They were divorced. They were the barren wife. Right? <laughs> Sing. You got more kids than the married wife down there, those Jews down in Israel. See? Now, what does it say here? Uh, uh, 17 again, right, 17. <laughs> no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Right? You shall be established in righteousness. Thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and the great, uh, great shall be the peace of thy children. He's talking to Israel now. Now, <clears throat> now that Christ, taking the place of God, was killed, God died, now God's law will allow God to remarry the divorced wife. 
Because the law says you can't re you can't remarry unless your unless your husband died. Uh -uh. You know, if you remarry, it's adultery. Well, it's not adultery now because Christ, in the form of God, died, and now God can open the door so the Israelites, the house of Israel, can get back in contact with Him and get on with their job of getting God to the rest of the world. Jeremiah 51. Oh, Jeremiah 51. Did we do that already? No, we didn't do that. That's right. This goes along with this last promise about no weapon. No weapon formed against thee will prevail. <laughs> the portion of Jacob is not like them, those other people, for he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. God speaking. Israel is the rod of God's inheritance. Israel is God's inheritance, and they're a rod. What do you do with a rod? Right? Rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Thou Israel, thou art my battle axe. All right, my battle axe and weapons of war. And with thee I will break in pieces the nations, and with thee I will destroy kingdoms. And with thee, Israel, the house of Israel, in the 1800s, in 1920, 1917, in 1917, Israel will be God's battle axe. That's what that means. Thou art my battle axe, weapons of war, for with thee I will break in pieces the nations, and with thee I will destroy kingdoms, and with thee I will break in pieces the horses and the riders. And it goes on for two or three more verses, breaking in pieces everything in the world. Who beat the Kaiser? Israel. Who beat Hitler? Israel. <laughs> right? You see, regardless of the fact that a certain group of elite have fomented practically every war that you can find in a history book, but especially World War II and I, and soon to be World War III, <laughs> even though those world elite who are working not for God fomented all these wars, who came out on top? Hmm? They didn't decide that Hitler was going to come out on top. All they did with Hitler was unify and separate and unify Europe into two complete units, Eastern and Western, you know, with the wall. Set up a, set up a division between the West and Russia. Cold War, oh boy. But even though all that manipulation happens, Israel wins, wins the war. Just because God said to David, one of your descendants will always be found ruling over groups of Israelites. If you've got an Israelite nation, like France, like Belgium, like Switzerland, like the Netherlands, like England, like Britain, if you've got an Israelite nation, one of your people, one of the descendants of you, David, will be ruling over those people. Because Judah got the birthright. Period. You know, there's no thinking about that. That's what God said will happen. He didn't say any of those kings and queens over the people would be good people and treat the people properly and wouldn't be corrupt, wouldn't start wars so that they could gain control over some other country. He didn't say that. He just said, Line of David would rule. He just said, God is my battle axe, you're my battle axe, and with you I will put down world tyranny. That's the, way, that's the way God has preserved the earth until today. If he hadn't said that he was going to do that and 
there was no guideline for that, <laughs> we probably would be all dead, right? Because somebody else is at work doing it, you know, trying to control everything. It was God's way of keeping, keeping the world uh, sane for a while anyway. See, Revelation, doesn't Revelation say he cuts it short, otherwise everything would be gone? Well, God's been cutting it short for 2,000 years. <laughs> God, uh, you, you are my battle axe, right? Okay, now let's go back again to uh, Genesis. <clears throat> oh, wait a minute. Is this, is this the right Genesis here? Uh, no, that's, that's, that's the next one. The first one is Genesis 22, 17 again. 17. Okay. 2217. What does 2217 say? 22. That's the other page here. It says that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand of the seashore. Who is that to? That's Abram. Okay. That's early on. Abram. Okay. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Talk a lot about gates, enemies, right? When there's this big population group, you're going to find that the Israelites will control all the major access points of the earth. Gibraltar, Suez, Cape of Good Hope, uh, Madagascar on the other, other side around there, the two, the two entrances on either side of the Arabian Peninsula, the Panama Canal, the, the, the Falkland Islands down, Hong Kong, uh, on and on and on, all by Britain or the United States, mostly Britain. Okay, I gotta show you this. I think I showed you this once before. Every, every one of these red, these red circles is a gate, an access point on the earth. Okay. Where is it? Look at all those red circles. Ah, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. Major access points. And they're all controlled by Britain or the United States. By the elite. Don't you know that the elite are Israelites? Many, many, many of the elite are Jewish. Jewish. One person I trust said just recently that when the Jews were threatened with beheading or become Catholic, I think it was in Spain, they converted on the surface. And then they proceeded to infiltrate the Catholic hierarchy and became the Jesuits. <laughs> well, sure, why not? Why not? It's what they did every place else, right? It's what they did every place else. Possess the gates of their enemies. Now God's going to repeat himself. Always does. Go over to chapter 24, 24, and Abram says, oh, wait a minute, we're living down here amongst all these Canaanites and all their idol worship and all their bad stuff, and we're not going we're not gonna, to gonna take a chance as we got to get a wife for Isaac that's out of the proper family line. Now, Eleazar, he doesn't say Eleazar, but that's who it is. Eleazar, his main servant. He says, Eliezer, take a couple of guys with you and some presents and camels and stuff and go up to Haran. Go up there to Laban's people. There are, there are cousins up there. And get a wife for Isaac and bring her back. And I won't tell you the whole story, but he shows up. He finds Rebecca. She says, okay, I'll go. And they're just about ready to leave. And the family comes out to say goodbye and 
wave and all that stuff. Okay, that's the setup. And her brother and sister and mother said, let the damsel abide a few days, and she does. Um, and they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant and his men. Verse 60, 24, 60. And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions. This isn't God talking. They, this is Rebecca's, and she's saying the same thing, or she's being said to, the same thing that God says. Like the stars in the sand, all your kids, right? Mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those that hate you, hate them. But guess the gates of their enemies. Same thing, same trip, okay? Now, numbers, there's, there's another one that says they're going to control the sea, right? They control the seas. Well, you certainly, you certainly don't need any Bible verses to reference that they control the sea, not once you know that Ephraim becomes a world empire and they happen to be Britain, Britain, and Britain controlled the sea better than anybody. Uh, Spain, they were there, you know, the Armada and all that stuff. But what happened? <laughs> what happened to the Armada? Huh? Supernatural, whatever, look it up. Uh, Spain, France, well, yeah, they were explorers. France, Portugal had some, you know, all that, yeah. The, the Netherlands even, you know. But the greatest, the greatest empire uh, of history controlled the seas over every place. You know, were the French down in Hong Kong, <laughs> you know? So all you have to know is who controlled the seas as the greatest empire in the world, and you find the Israelites. You don't even need the Bible for that, okay? Some of these, some of these Bible references are kind of on the side a little bit. Like 24, 7 says, He shall pour out the water from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. Right. Um, Isaiah 60, 60. Is that verse 5? 60, verse 5. Yeah. Then thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because of the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces of the Gentiles, the wealth of the Gentiles, shall come to thee. And Isaiah is talking to Israel here. Okay? Okay? And this is all the way down into the millennium, some of it. Control the seas. Uh, let's let's see. Super. Oh oh, I want to go back to Deuteronomy uh, because there's another controlling the seas, but it's specific control only to one tribe. It isn't control of the seas. It's just that they will be involved with the sea almost more than any other tribe. Okay, the tribe of Zebulon, tribe of Zebulon, and that's two. This again is 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 Moses, again, um, telling all the different tribes what's what's going to happen uh, later on. You know, thirty three nineteen. Genesis thirty three. I mean uh, Deuteronomy thirty three nineteen. We already told you about Joseph, right? Right, and he should push the people to the ends of the earth. Well, for Zebulon, it says, it says, uh, rejoice, Zebulon, in thy, and to Zebulon, 18, and to Zebulon, he said, uh, 
Rejoice, Zebulun, in thy going in and out, and Issachar in thy tents. You're going to find Issachar with Zebulun, but for Zebulun, they shall call the people unto the mountain. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness, they, for they shall suck the abundance of the seas and of treasures hidden in the sand. Zebulun, along with some people from Issachar, are going to be heavy into the sea stuff. And, and Cap, there's, a, there's a really good book called The Strange Parallel um, that you can get from the Covenant people. At least they used to have it, the Covenant people. And it outlines all the, all the parallels between what Zebulon is prophesied and promised to do or have or be with what the Netherlands is today. One place it says that Zebulon would be a haven for ships. Uh, they'll be by the sea. Um, they, they invented a very specific and unique kind of, of fishing net arrangement, a couple of nets on both sides, of the, both sides of the boat that hung down and stuff, and they're heavy into the sea, fishing and so forth.